audio. Hi, hi director, director Strickler. Good to see you. Everybody else. We're still having technical difficulties. You're on mute, I believe. Uh oh. I, can't, I couldn't hear you guys. Or if you're okay, are, are can you, you, should I give a comment now? Yes. I don't think Baker could hear as well. You can. Can you hear us now? Yes. I can hear you now. Okay. I can hear. All right, go ahead and comment. Thank you. Okay, well, th thank you, members of the OTC, for having us here today. My name is Roy Bialystowski. I'm the mayor of Westland. I want to start by just thanking the Transportation Commissioners and ODOT for their work to respond quickly to the tolling pause. Um, that being said, with regard to the finance plan, which is what I'm commenting on, I'm a little bit disappointed in lack of engagement from ODOT with local governments and its own advisory body, RTAC, uh, on this very significant finance document. Uh, we all first got to see the finance plan just about 36 hours ago. And it was kind of a scramble to prepare comments. Uh, so I wish local governments got to see <laughs> and provide input in advance for your consideration, which would be more fruitful. fruitful. Uh, notably absent from the plan is any mention of revenue sharing uh, or, or funding for mitigation and so-called nexus priority project list that ODOT has been pressing local governments to submit uh, for consideration. I urge the commission to ask ODOT about this because without an understanding of what funding could be available for local government projects related to tolling, it's impossible for local jurisdictions to submit projects for consideration. Um, the proposal to cancel phase two of 205 is concerning. Uh, the city supports elimination of the 12th river toll area in theory just because of the diversion that would happen from it uh, but we know nothing about the impacts associated with tolling only a two-lane road at abernathy bridge without adding lanes the ea didn't contemplate this bottleneck uh, and it represents a sea change canceling that project represents a sea change from what we know uh, so i urged otc to seek real data about those impacts and i just want to finally re reiterate my call for regional equity in this process. Tolling should not be placed in a location that burdens large cities and its residents only and requires them to pay a disproportionate share of mega infrastructure projects that benefit the entire state while others get off scot-free without paying just because their daily trips don't require them to travel through the tolled area. A better, better financial solution other than tolling is needed to because of this quandary. So thank you for the opportunity to comment and for your consideration on those points. Thank you for your comments. Our next um, commenter is Commissioner Paul Savas. So nice to see you. Uh oh, you're muted. There you go. Chair Brown and Commission members, I am Paul Savas, a Clackamas County Commissioner. Back in 2015 and 2016, regional leaders in the metro region were meeting to discuss transportation funding for large projects, including the highway projects. In 2017, members of the Joint Transportation Committee asked us, the regional transportation leaders, to convene and propose a list of projects that had regional consensus. After months of work, we submitted three bottleneck projects, 217, 205, and the Rose Quarter. We were led to believe that a gas tax increase would be the funding mechanism for the three projects. All but one of those had funding identified in HB 2017, that be 205. 205 was deemed shovel ready and today phase one is underway and phase two remains the only project today shovel ready. We cannot afford to squander this opportunity to finish what was started and finish what was committed to in HB 2017 and HB 3055. I urge you all to listen to the Regional Transportation Advisory Committee meeting that occurred this Monday, that's 26th of June. 
you will hear concerns of informed, respected leaders with informed support of their experienced staff. The jurisdictional leaders of cities and counties have identified serious concerns with this particular approach ODOT is wrangling with. The material in your packet today comes as no surprise. Inflation has undermined the plan. ODOT's own data has shown that toll revenues would not be sufficient to fund both the capital and the required mitigations, not to mention that the proposed mitigations are woefully insufficient at relieving diversion and improving safety. To cancel two, phase two of 205 would require new modeling, burn more money, burn more time, and incur more inflation as a result of the self-imposed delay. Consider asking, asking this question, is it feasible to proceed with this particular tolling approach? It is evident to many that the cost to operate it, mitigate, administer, and the financial cost to stand it up will not yield much, if any, revenue. The obvious solution is to put a pause on the new projects that are not shovel ready, especially those that are not included in HB 2017, and raise the gas tax to complete the work. We as regional leaders, knowledgeable in transportation, stand ready to work with the state, ODOT, and the Joint Transportation Committee to find funding solutions that will yield revenue that are not cost burdened with extraordinary mitigation expense. We recognize gas tax is not a sustainable funding mechanism. When I hear some of our legislators say, I came from a state that told roads, two things come to mind. I too came from a state that told and did it well. Secondly, those states are not doing what is proposed here today. There are sections of our highway system that can be told with minimal mitigation that will yield revenue. However, there are sections that will be cost burdened that are not feasible to toll without substantial investments in transit and mitigation projects. Let's be smart, let's be surgical in our approach, and most importantly, please collaborate with us. I'm available and ready to respond to any questions now or in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. It's great seeing you. So I don't know, is Council President Mary Baumgarter on? Yes. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I don't know if you can see me, but that's okay. We cannot so see you. On? Yes, okay. but you go ahead. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for the opportunity to address this body. Um, I would just like to briefly say um, with respect, I don't have um, prepared comments because of the shortness of the time that I learned about this, but I just wanted to comment because I have been so closely observing this process so far, and I would implore that going forward, that basically I'd like to echo the comments made both by Mayor Bialystowski and Commissioner Savas about equity of the placement of tolling, um, and also consideration of the communities expressly that will be impacted I understand the perception that West Lynn is a community that can withstand, financially withstand the impacts of tolling. I would like to argue that that is not a, a good way to view this and it's to short-sighted um, Are you still there? Or did who will lose? be impacted Whoops. detrimentally Wait. by tolling? Oh, is my connection not yeah. working? We lost you at short-sighted. Sorry. Oh, okay. Thank you. I just wanted to basically say I, I stand ready to support a tolling program that would work. I am extremely concerned about climate issues and extremely concerned about equity issues. And I don't think the current plan, as it was visioned was going to address adequately those concerns, but I would like to participate in the pro in the project going forward and and hope that we are able to be more informed and not just talked at. Um, but thank you so much. I do appreciate your time. I'm sorry about my connection and my ad hoc comments. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you for your comments. Hey, Mr. Courtright, nice to see you again. Um, thank you, Commissioner. For the record, Joe Courtright, I'm an economist with City Observatory and a member of No More Freeways. I'm commenting on the Urban Mobility Finance Plan. And this isn't really so much a plan at all as it, was, as it is a belated and only partial admission of the deep-seated structural financial problems for which your staff has no serious solution. 
The plan that they're offering is a vague hope that more federal and state funds will magically appear for the projects in the urban mobility plan. The fiscal crisis that ODOT is now in was foreseeable and foreseen to anyone who took a serious look at the, at the agency's finances. Your revenue model and your expenditure uh, processes are broken. The gas tax is already coming in below projections and is projected to decline further. Vehicle miles traveled, according to your own forecast, are in permanent decline. The state climate goals call for a 50% decline in gasoline sales, which will further reduce your revenue. And we received notice earlier this month that the highway cost allocation study shows that because of ODOT spending patterns, we'll have to spend, we'll have to reimburse trucks and heavy over-the-road vehicles about $220 million per year. So your revenue situation is far worse than you've acknowledged. And in the face of it, the urban mobility plan is confronting you with a huge cost overrun. We've seen that the Rose Quarter Project's price tag has now ballooned to $1.9 billion, more than four times the $450 million that the legislature was told that this project would cost when it approved it in 2017. Um, in the face of these overruns, there is not one word in this plan about right-sizing any of these projects, which are all overbuilt. And I would note that then speaker, now governor, Tina Kotek called for right-sizing these projects in 2021 when she voted against House Bill 3055, which authorized the commission to do additional borrowing. So please take a close look at the scale of these projects because your staff has um, explicitly concealed, or I should say, has concealed exactly how large these projects are. The reason they're so expensive, the IBR and the Rose Quarter, is that the Rose Quarter project is a 10-lane wide freeway project, and the IBR is a 12-lane wide freeway project. If these projects were right-sized, they would be vastly less expensive. And then finally, you're counting on toll revenues to bail out your financial situation. As an economist, I can tell you the effect of tolls will be to reduce traffic, which in many respects is a good thing. But by um, by tolling these roadways to pay for them, you will essentially obviate the need for additional capacity. ODOT's own studies of the Rose Quarter project show that implementation of regional mobility pricing will be more effective in reducing congestion than the now $1.9 billion cost of widening the roadway through there. In the past, you have pursued a piecemeal approach to these projects. ODOT is in the midst of a serious financial crisis the cost of these projects is exploding. It's time to take a serious, objective look. And I just have to say, as somebody who's been commenting on these projects for more than a couple of decades now, some engagement by your staff in a serious fashion, rather than just two minutes of enduring the comments that we make and then simply ignoring them, would be much appreciated. We have technical expertise and would be happy to engage with your staff and assist the commission to deal with the gnarly financial problems that it faces. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And our last commenter is Mr. McCabe. Is he present? Okay. Okay, I, I am present. Am I being heard? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, Thank you. I know I uh, discussed some of the items before you in your last meeting in May, but House Bill 2017 did have a 10, 10 cent gas tax increase, gas tax increase, and um, and the EV um, registrations were also increased. So the prob part of the problem is that the legislature wanted certain projects to be completed, and I think now the legislature needs to come back and reorganize which ones can be delayed so that uh, it can all fit within the budget. And what the key problem is, is the miles that are driven in the state of Oregon. It's The growth rate is only 1% a year. Um, and with the slight increase in tax, it, it, it can't keep up with just 1% increase in miles driven per year. This is from the ODET, ODOT audit. And then the complaint has been made that the electric cars are part of the problem. Well, there's less than 60,000, there's barely more than 60,000 cars in the state of electric cars in Oregon per DMV. So the electric cars really decreasing the revenue is not the problem. The problem is fewer miles driven. 
Then on the funding of tolling, it's still in the budget that ODOT is presenting you today. Um, last month, it was said that, uh, the, that they would still put the tolling gantries in on I-205. If we do not know when or if tolling is going to begin, that should be removed from the project. And in addition to that, they still have meetings scheduled all throughout um, July, August, and so forth to tell people what's going to happen with tolling and how much money could be saved if this wasn't done. And if maybe the tolling aspect is just shifted to the I-5 replacement project and back off at I-205 at this time. Uh, one of the problems is, is um, why the tolling is bad for just I-205 is the ODOT projection is $600 per family increase for uh, transportation cost, which is 256% higher than the rest of the state pays in gas tax. So it is an unfair burden um, with the $600 that is forecasted by ODOT. And then we were also told that they're told that there was no uh, federal funding for the I-205 project. So basically there's really no money for the project. Then in addition, the mitigation issues, um, last time it was said that there would be grants given. Um, there's no guarantee at all. I live right outside. I could be a traffic reporter. We always know when something's wrong on 205 because of how bad the traffic is on Borland Road and it will only get worse and it's still not being addressed. Uh, so if I-205 was expanded, they wouldn't need to use our area. But then the other area that needs to be dealt with that ODOT refuses to, because it was asked during the meetings, lower the speed limit. We are in the metro, we are close to a metropolitan area. Metropolitan area speed limits are supposed to be 55 miles per hour. When I brought this up to ODOT and ODOT staff, they said, we are not gonna do it, we don't care. OTC needs to override ODOT, have them lower the speed limits, make it safer, because one of the problems we have in our area here, which causes the uh, majority of the car accidents, and especially right now, is in a period of four miles, we go from 65 to 55 to 45, and you always have drivers that don't care what it says, they keep on driving 65, and the next thing that you know, they hit the car in front of them. Why ODOT doesn't see this as a problem is beyond me. It's a simple solution to get these roads to be safer. I thank you for your time. And thank you for your comment. This is, I'm going to close the comment period, but before we move on to the next item in our on our agenda, I just want to... Um, respond just a little bit to all of your comments. I appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. I think it's very important that we hear all voices and I'm going to hold you accountable now that you've spoke out and said you have solutions and that you can be part of this conversation. And we're going to be asking you to be part of that conversation because it is going to take all of us to get us out of this position that we're in. So thank you again for your comments. And I, this point, I'm going to uh, move on and let the staff talk about our UMO plan. Chair Brown, members of the commission, for the record, I am Travis Brower and I am here with Mr. Finn. I'll let him introduce my, himself and then we'll take it from there. Yeah, good morning, Madam Chair, uh, commissioners, new commissioners, uh, Brendan Finn, Director of ODOT's Urban Mobility Office. So we are here today for you know, a uh, seemingly narrow purpose, which is to approve the finance plan, to present that to you today, ask you for your consideration, and have that submitted to Governor Kotek uh, by Friday, uh, as it is requested to be delivered on July 1st. But in a broader sense, this is a really important time for us to step back a little bit and take stock and refresh the funding plan that we have been developing and implementing for the urban mobility strategy. 
since we started this work, a lot has changed about these projects and about the cost and revenue. So first we've seen project scope has grown significantly on some of the projects, particularly the I-5 Rose Quarters. We've refined that design uh, and scope with the community and that has increased cost. We've also seen that project costs have grown significantly due to inflation that is at historically high levels, uh, as well as some of the delays that we have seen on these projects as we've worked with the community. And then, uh, you know, finally, the, the changes to the tolling schedule have uh, delayed the onset of that revenue, made the revenue from tolling somewhat less certain. So as a result of all those factors, we need to, to refresh our approach uh, and in many ways, make sure that we are taking a prudent and conservative approach to this finance plan and have a very transparent discussion with the commission uh, and our partners in the region about how we can move forward the projects in this plan that Oregonians have requested that ODOT deliver within the means that are available to us. So today we're gonna to do a few things. So first, Brendan is gonna walk you through the urban mobility strategy projects to really ground you in what those projects are, uh, what the benefits are, uh, and uh, the, the cost estimates that we have today. I am going to walk you through the funding and finance for the urban mobility strategy, starting with the shorter term, with the reasonably anticipated revenues we have in the near future, uh, and then talk about how we would propose moving the projects forward using those revenues. I will also walk you through the longer term finance plan that looks to additional funding that might be able to help us complete these projects uh, and talk about the additional steps that are needed to firm up uh, that finance plan for the long term. And then Mr. Finn will present three options to, to modify the finance plan uh, to spend more or less on the various options uh, as we move forward. And after you decide on, on moving forward or not with any of the modifications, we will ask you to approve the plan to submit to the governor's office as requested by July 1st. This finance plan may very well require some STIP amendments, uh, for example, to complete the work on the Abernathy Bridge that we've proposed. Uh, if that is the case, we'll bring those back to the commission later in the year, most likely in September, for you to effectuate. And that's just one of the senses in which this is uh, your action today is by no means the final word. Uh, it is an iterative, ongoing development of this plan and, and the implementation of this plan. And it's really the start of a new conversation uh, between the commission, the region, the governor, and the legislature as we move forward uh, and work through these financial and other issues uh, to move the urban mobility strategy projects forward. So with that, I'll turn it to Mr. Finn. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brower. Um, again, uh, for the record, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners Brendan Finn, Director of ODOT's Urban Mobility Office. Um, as Mr. Brower alluded to, I'm going to briefly talk about where the costs are for these projects right now as it relates uh, to the, your consideration of the financial plan. Um, talk a little bit about current conditions, uh, where we are with those projects right now, and then again, uh, some consideration uh, for various options we're gonna bring forward to you. Next slide, please. Uh, but before we do, <clears throat> um, as we've started off uh, for the past two and a half years, every time we've been before you, Madam Chair, uh, new commissioners, you'll get used to uh, to seeing this illustration in our urban mobility strategy map, which uh, has been through an iterative process through the leadership of the commission and the Joint Committee on Transportation to really see the vision that is in, uh, unlike any other in the United States as it relates to dealing with congestion and mobility issues and challenges that we're seeing in the Portland metropolitan region, again, that were highlighted uh, early on in 2017. That package really got things going with this strategy, uh, refined by other uh, legislation uh, and also through uh, the leadership and direction of, of this commission. And at its essence, what the urban mobility strategy uh, does is take a comprehensive look at the entire region. Uh, the process of the past uh, through the 1950s and 60s of putting together individual projects has only pushed the problem around and impacted communities and hasn't pushed uh, us forward in addressing these issues. This strategy also addresses two generations of disinvestment in the system in the Portland metropolitan region. Uh, this is done through partnerships. It's done through these strategic investments. We'll talk about uh, a few of them today where they are 
and a, uh, a regional tolling system uh, because there is the recognition that we've all had that we cannot build our way out of congestion. We need to manage demand. We need to provide other options uh, and other modes. So I'd like to present, uh, have that context to, before we speak on this, uh, Madam Chair, uh, as this strategy has been um, uh, codified and, uh, and adapted as it's moved forward, as it will continue to be uh, adapted as we move forward. So uh, with that context, I'll go to the next slide, please. So here's where we are right now. Uh, I, this You're going to see this uh, slide a couple of times uh, a little bit later. Mr. Brower is going to talk about it too as we uh, get into some of the financial conditions and uh, issues around some of the projects. But this is where we are right now. And I'm, uh, again, uh, we'll talk more in depth and have a conversation about uh, some of these pieces. But to, to start off, the Buy Five Rose Quarter project, uh, we're looking at a 2025 construction start. Uh, there's the estimated cost between 1.5 and 1.9 billion. The I-205 improvements and all that uh, in, is encompassed in that project uh, right now is in between uh, 1.2 billion and 1.3 billion. Uh, there's the components as they break out. Again, I'm going to be going through that here just in a moment. Um, the I-5 Boone Bridge, which is uh, in its very nascent stages, I'll talk about where that is now and its uh, price range that's there. The Regional Mobility Pricing Project, um, that 200 and, uh, to $250 million, I'll, I'll break down a little bit about what that cost is. And then the back office and customer service system uh, that's related to a toll system, uh, that is a uh, obviously huge endeavor and business line to be taken on by the agency. Uh, the cost of that we have right now at $115 million. And you'll see the range that we have uh, in current uh, and for our current uh, estimates for the urban mobility strategy is 3.7 to 4.3 billion. Next slide, please. A little context on where we've been uh, since 2017 and some of the drivers of this cost. Yes, there has been modifications uh, in scope to some of these projects to respond to, to a lot of the issues uh, and comments that we've heard from our partners in the region who are, um, critical to the success of the urban mobility strategy as well. But we really want to, uh, this is something a lot of folks have known about, but really laying out some of the numbers on where construction costs have gone uh, around materials, labor, inflation. Uh, since 2017, uh, nationally, construction costs have increased by 72%. Uh, we've seen, as you can see on this graph, some of the highest cost increases, again, across the industry, 50% uh, since 2020, and material costs, uh, obviously, primary factor to that, um, combined with the others that I just mentioned. Want to just uh, set the table on that, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioners, just uh, so it can give you a little bit of background as we talk about uh, some of the costs here for these projects. Next slide, please. And I'd like to start with uh, the Rose Quarter Improvement Project um, and the journey uh, that this, this project has been on uh, to meet so many different um, and laudable goals uh, around transportation, uh, around community development, around partnership, um, and where we've been since 2017, since the original um, cost estimate that came in, the commission uh, did get a refined uh, cost on that in 2019. And uh, more recently, in 2020, there was an independent cover assessment uh, that led to the direction to implement uh, what we refer to as Hybrid 3. Hybrid 3, uh, in working with uh, the historic Albina uh, Advisory Board, which is our main advisory board, I'll, I'll mention a little bit uh, a meeting I had with them uh, last night, uh, as well as the Albina Vision Trust, really look at this project as, as being restorative uh, for the wrongs that have taken place uh, with the construction of I-5 and it's um, the contribution that it had in taking apart that Albina community and how this independent cover assessment and the hybrid three design uh, would help rebuild uh, and reconnect that community. And we've done that in, uh, in, in collaboration with uh, the historic voices that exist there um, and that have those connections and have for generations. 
since we've let had hybrid three go through our environmental process, we've heard from other partners, we've heard from uh, the public about the importance of safety. Uh, in particular, I'll, I'll just bring to the commission's attention, uh, the southbound ramp, as you'll see there is number six. Um, that was uh, in the original uh, design would be the only southbound off ramp. As you can see, it would be uh, dumping right down there in front of the Moda Center. That is a very active bicycle and pedestrian corridor uh, during events, uh, but also uh, during um, peak hours, people use that corridor quite a bit. We took um, a lot of the comments that we heard, and again, working with in partnership uh, with the Portland Trailblazers and Rose City Management, came up with design refinements to address some of those issues. You'll see that circle in the lower right-hand portion uh, of the slide there where we created a uh, another off ramp that's uh, there listed as number, uh, excuse me, number six as well. You can see it coming across I-5 and then going to Widler. That takes about two thirds of the traffic that was going to be um, coming off there in front of the motor center and sends it over to that portion uh, for where that wherever the trip destination is. Uh, we also re, uh, reinvigorated the uh, Calacamus Bicycle and Pedestrian Crossing. As you can see there, direct connection to the Moda Center, um, but also importantly is this is a connection to a region-wide loop called the Green Loop uh, that goes around the Portland area to really provide a, a cohesive connection uh, for bicycles and pedestrians and those rolling uh, through, the, uh, through the Portland region. So these uh, these design refinements, we've we've costed them. Uh, obviously, that's what's triggered some of the uh, cost uh, um, uh, increases that you saw, uh, but also that's um, a reflection of some of the cost increases that have just come uh, to the construction industry. I did want to mention to the commission, I uh, met with the Historic Albina Advisory Board last night, um, and the Albina Vision Trust was there as well. I, I let them know uh, where we are uh, with our finances, what I was going to be proposing for the commission's consideration this morning, um, which would put a delay uh, on our ability to go to construction, uh, but would still keep this project going from the design perspective. Again, I wanna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I, I do want the commission to know that this, um, We've built trust with this board, uh, but there was a level of disappointment that I need to convey to you. Um, again, this group represents generations uh, that have historic and ties to, and connections to the Albina community that was impacted with the construction of I-5 and, um, and other pieces that, that really uh, took that community away from, uh, from the African-American community. So it was an emotional meeting. Um, and I did ask them if they would continue to have the trust and continue to work with us as we uh, continue the design process to get this project to uh, a condition where it will be um, uh, very competitive for federal grants uh, and also other discussions for other funding options to, for us to get this project uh, constructed. So wanted to share that uh, with you, uh, Madam Chair. I don't speak for these individuals, uh, they speak for themselves. Um, they will also, uh, as uh, Madam Chair, as you've called for involvement for those that testified today, um, they, will, they will want to be involved as well. So um, next slide. Uh, the the I-205 improvements, uh, we do have some consideration for that uh, for you as well, based on the current financial situation we find ourselves in. Uh, this currently is uh, phase one is under construction. Uh, the Abernathy Bridge, uh, if you drive by there, uh, a lot of work happening uh, to, to provide a, uh, a seismically resilient bridge, incredibly important to that community. We got construction going earlier on this project, which saved us a lot of money, as uh, we saw uh, at the time, we thought it was about $30 million to get that project started uh, a year early. Uh, and looking at those inflationary figures, uh, we probably saved a lot more uh, by getting things going. So seven miles of improvements for the entire uh, corridor, nine bridges, three sound walls. Uh, we also are making improvements to the bike, bicycle and pedestrian system there, um, improved interchanges, uh, new information signs, uh, and part of the phase two 
uh, which from Mr. Brower will talk about where we are with that, um, would create a new travel lane uh, in each direction. Uh, we're currently in the environmental review process for phase two, uh, as well as the tolling project uh, that is critical to us to being to able to fund these improvements. Next slide. The I-5 Boone Bridge, as, as I mentioned in the beginning, this, this uh, at its most nascent stage, we currently have planning dollars uh, associated with this. Uh, it's at 5% design, so we don't like to um, uh, put too much stock in the, the numbers that we're putting forward right now. As far as costs are concerned, we need to have a better uh, grasp on that as we get further on in the design process. But right now, it's in the preliminary planning process, uh, we refer to as PEL. Try not to use too many acronyms while I'm here, uh, but it's part of the NEPA approval process we go through with our partners at the Federal Highway Administration. So that's where that project is now. Next slide. And uh, key to everything uh, that is in the urban mobility strategy is, uh, is our ability to, uh, as I said, not build our way out of congestion, make these strategic investments that we need to make on some of these bottlenecks and to create that seismically resilient system. Uh, we need to have a regional mobility pricing project, uh, again, to raise revenue, but to also uh, manage demand on the system. The uh, regional mobility pricing project, we are in preliminary engineering and environmental review process. Uh, where the gantries go, uh, how that is going to work out from an engineering perspective is still uh, being, uh, being ironed out, and we're working with our consultant teams on that. Uh, and as I mentioned, the toll system implementation that's under uh, Mr. Mr. Brower's portfolio uh, is a, a huge endeavor as well, uh, a big business line uh, to be taken on by the agency. So uh, that part is uh, in process with requests for proposals, getting ready to go out to create the back office, the customer service center development and procurement. So uh, with that overview, I'd like to turn it back over to Mr. Biot Brower and you'll see uh, the first slide. Uh, that I went over. So uh, back over to you, Travis. Thank you, Mr. Finn. So everything that Brendan uh, walked you through uh, totals up to a grand total of about 3.7 to $4.35 billion. I highlighted that at the bottom. Uh, my job and my team's job has been to work with the, the mobility office to, to determine how can we bring the resources to bear for that. So we're going to walk you through that in two timelines, both the short-term and the long-term, starting with the short-term. But, but first, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, on this. So the urban mobility strategy has a number of funding sources. We have broken those down and characterized one group of them as reasonably anticipated revenue in the near future. Uh, so they are included in the short-term finance plan. And then we have also categorized some as prospective funding that they're included in the long term, but we cannot really bank on these and thus we have not put them in the short term finance plan for what is available to us in the near future. So the three that we consider reasonably anticipated revenue are the HB 2017 cash and bond proceeds uh, that were generated from the $30 million in annual funding that was dedicated by the legislature to the urban mobility strategy in HB 2017 as uh, updated and amended by HB 3055 uh, two years ago. We also include I-205 toll revenue uh, and other funds that have been allocated uh, by the OTC uh, and by local government. That's federal, state, and local contributions. The two prospective funding sources are the Regional Mobility Pricing Project toll revenue, which we have not yet estimated because we are still in the early stages of the process of developing the toll framework. We're working with the region in the near term uh, to work through what that program looks like uh, and what the toll rate structure would be. And then once that has been determined and we begin that analysis in the environmental review process, we'll be able to do a level two traffic revenue study that will uh, give us a sense of what the annual toll revenue will be. We then do a further analysis that, that tells us what the total uh, cash and bond proceeds could be from the regional mobility pricing project. So that work will play out over the next couple of years. The second prospective funding source is federal discretionary grants. As a result of the uh, passage of the IIJA, there are significant federal resources available, particularly from the infra program, which funds uh, freight mobility projects and, and projects that improve mobility. Uh, and 
also the Reconnecting Communities program, uh, which we think is tailor-made for the Rose Quarter. And in fact, uh, USDOT has already provided a million dollars for planning efforts uh, around the highway covers in Albina. And we hope that is a sign that they would like to fund this project uh, going forward in the future. But those are included in the potential funding in the second phase, uh, rather than the money that we have in the near term. There are, mm -hmm. Sorry, Travis, to interrupt you. I just wanted to pause for one second and see if any of the commissioners had any questions on the funding. I'm seeing head shakes, no, but okay. All right, thank you. Sure. Oh, yes. Uh, just because I think it's going to be relevant as we go forward, can we go back one slide? As we look at the construction start dates on mm -hmm. each of those, uh, I want to provide crystal clarity for the commission. Uh, how many of those are a fixed and guaranteed construction start date versus which of those are uh, the earliest construction could start pending uh, pending uh, additional funding? Yeah, Chair Brown, Director Strickler, that is a really good question. A, a moment of full disclosure is that these dates are based on uh, the best, best available information we have uh, at this point, and yet some of them we know are not likely ones that we're going to hit. So we have started on, on the I-205 Abernathy Bridge, uh, and so that is locked in. The others are prospective start dates that are dependent on the ongoing work of doing the environmental review and design refinement, and also on the availability of funds. So one of the risks, that, and I'll lay this out at the toward the end of the presentation, is if any of those construction start dates move for any reason, whether that's because of NEPA and design refinement or because we simply don't have the funds when we get to that date, then we push the construction start date out. Uh, and as you looked in the uh, finance plan, that comes with additional costs associated with it. Uh, and so we have disclosed that in here and, and make it very clear that the additional costs could rack up if there are further delays to these projects. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. So beyond funding, we are also using a number of financing mechanisms that will help us leverage those long-term revenue streams into upfront uh, infusion of cash for the projects. Uh, one of the largest is the highway user tax revenue bonds. Those are the bread and butter bonds that ODOT issues on a regular basis to pay for projects based on legislative authorization. And those would be backed by the HB 2017 funds. In fact, we've already sold the first tranche of these bonds uh, last year. Uh, we also have a number of toll-backed forms of debt. So short-term borrowing that would be repaid when we take out long-term uh, debt from bonds or a TIFIA loan. Uh, we've already taken out about $150 million in this program in commercial paper. Uh, that is short-term loans, but that can be rolled over uh, over time. Uh, and that is a program that was authorized by the legislature and stood up in conjunction with the Treasury Department. So we have folks looking over our shoulder as we're doing that work. We would also be looking to uh, issue potentially tollback bonds, uh, as well as look to the federal government for loans under the Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, or TIFIA program, which offers very favorable financing uh, terms, including low interest rates, low coverage rates, uh, long repayment terms that can help us leverage uh, funding further. In fact, we've as essentially assumed that uh, we would be able to get a TIFIA loan for I-205 to, to stretch our dollars much further. I should know that any of those long-term debt instruments do require legislative authorization. So we have gone through the legislative approval process for the highway user tax revenue bonds, and we'll be doing that for the tollback bonds as well. Next slide, please. So uh, part of this finance plan was designed to lay out the implications for finance and funding if tolling or now that tolling has been delayed. So I want to walk you through uh, how that has impacted the, the project's schedule and plan. Toll financing uh, to pay back expenditures on I-205 Abernathy Bridge won't be available until 2027 if we start tolling in 2026. That presents some challenges for cash flow. So to avoid running out of cash, we cannot commit to additional project work and we're going to have to postpone I-205 phase two, uh, shown in this picture where we would be looking to add another, uh, the missing lane uh, between uh, 
Stafford Road and the Abernathy Bridge, uh, and also uh, add seismic improvements that will make the that segment of the corridor earthquake ready for when the big one hits. If we delay uh, phase two, then there is some work that we had added to phase two that was postponed or deferred from the Abernathy Bridge project that is currently under construction that is soil stabilization work on the Abernathy that is needed in order to ensure that that bridge is earthquake ready. Doing that, it's about $50 million plus, and that was done because we did not have a, uh, as much work done on that, and the, the pricing came in at a level we thought we could get a better deal if we did some additional work and deferred that. So doing that will require shifting more of our HB 2017 resources to I-205 uh, to fully fund the Abernathy Bridge and cover the project's cash flow needs. Uh, and that postponement of phase two means that ODOT will be unable to assess tolls on the Tualatin River bridges because under federal law, you can toll a bridge when it's repaired or replaced. We'll be doing neither of those uh, in the short term. Uh, so we will have our tolling reduced to tolling only on the Abernathy Bridge, which will reduce available resources. We have estimated based on the initial level two traffic and revenue analysis that we've done, that tolling on the I-205 Abernathy alone will bring in about $385 million in total resources compared to $700 million for both. But I will note that that is an estimate and we will be doing an updated level two traffic and revenue analysis based on tolling Abernathy only and understanding what that will do to the traffic patterns, including congestion relief levels, uh, diversion uh, to other routes, et cetera. Uh, and that will be coming in the, the not too distant future. Next slide, please. So this brings us to the available funding before and after the, the change in toll collection schedule. Uh, so the only thing that really changed is the amount of revenue that we expect we can get from I-205 tolls, uh, which by going to tolling only on Abernathy Bridge, uh, it reduces from 700 million uh, to approximately 385 million. That takes the total resources down from $1.4 billion to $1.1 billion that we have reasonably available in the near term. So I should note, however, that while we include I-205 tolls in the funding mix of reasonably anticipated revenue, uh, those dollars are not in the bank in the same way that the HB 2017 funds or the other federal, state, local funds are in the bank. There is some risk of, to these funds uh, because we need to get federal and regional approval for tolling the I-205 bridge, and ultimately the commission needs to approve tolling the bridge and set the toll rates in order to uh, achieve that those revenues. However, we've already put the Abernathy Bridge uh, project out to bid based on the assumption of being able to toll this, uh, and it is under contract, under construction. So we have now the, the situation where if for any reason tolls on I-205 do not move forward, whether that's due to action at the federal, state, or regional level, uh, it would punch a significant hole in the finance plan. The size of that hole will depend on when tolling is blocked. So for example, uh, if we uh, get through all the work that we have uh, laid out in this finance plan and then tolling were blocked at the end, uh, we would have spent the money. And so we'd have a larger gap as opposed to if uh, you know, tolling were blocked say in you know, the next several months before we've spent a lot of that money. So this is something the commission will need to, to think through as a, a risk. It's one of the risks that I show later on in the presentation uh, and understand what the implications would be. If for some reason tolling were blocked and you had to, to fill that hole, uh, you would have to take money from the STIP uh, in order to, to make up that gap because the hole is on the would be on the Abernathy Bridge. That likely would mean taking money from bridge and seismic projects from across the state. For context, in the 24-27 STIP, we have about $480 million uh, in the bridge program. And so that would take uh, almost the entirety of our bridge and seismic program at, in the worst case scenario. All right, so next slide, please. As noted, we have uh, about $1.1 billion to work with. So as we developed uh, a recommendation on how to use that, we uh, looked at where the projects were in, in the process and tried to find a logical phase 
uh, to complete using this available funding. And we based this on the direction the commission has already provided and the, the funding that has been approved to date for each of these projects. So we focused on completing the earthquake ready Abernathy Bridge uh, on I-205 and implementing tolling, advancing design work for the Rose Quarter. The key question on that that we're gonna get to in a few moments that Mr. Finn will walk you through is how far do we go on design of the Rose Quarter? We also would recommend completing the basic planning work that you funded on the I-5 Boone Bridge. Uh, and then of course on the two toll projects, uh, continuing that work in order to have toll revenue as a funding source for the urban mobility strategy going forward, particularly in the near term, establishing that back office and customer service systems that are really needed to operate tolling and then continuing the work on their urban mobility strategy. Next slide, please. So this is the actual recommended uh, set of amounts uh, for each of the projects in the urban mobility strategy, again, based on what the commission has already approved and based on logical stopping points for each of these projects. So on the I-205 Abernathy Bridge, we would recommend spending about $662 million uh, to complete that project. That would add in $50 million uh, plus some contingency for soil stabilization to get Abernathy uh, to an earthquake ready state. Uh, as noted, uh, we would recommend zeroing out the construction of phase two because there simply is not the resources to move forward uh, with the cash flow and, and available funding that we have. On I-205 tolling, uh, this would still need to move forward in order to pay back the costs of the Abernathy Bridge uh, that we have put forward. Uh, and this also, I should note, uh, does include setting aside resources uh, to pay for mitigation and other projects related to the project. So there is funding set aside currently uh, for mitigation to ensure that if there are uh, diversionary impacts uh, from tolling on the Abernathy Bridge that we are working to mitigate those and address those needs. We will have a better sense of what those look like because as you can imagine, if you're only tolling on the Abernathy Bridge uh, initially, that might have less impact on rerouting uh, than tolling on both bridges. So that will be an outcome of the level two traffic and revenue analysis. Uh, next on the Rose Quarter, we, oh, sorry, go back. <laughs> the next project uh, on Rose Quarter, we would recommend spending $158 million uh, to complete design of the three early work packages and reach 30% design of the main construction package, but that would not allow for any right-of-way acquisition, utility relocation, or construction. I should note too, in the finance plan, it lays out how much we've spent on each of these to date. The Rose Quarter, we anticipate we will have spent uh, by this Friday, the end of the month, uh, approximately $114 million. On I-5 Boone Bridge, you've only put $4 million into that. We'd recommend continuing that work uh, in order to complete the preliminary planning, but it doesn't get us into environmental review design or construction. On the Regional Mobility Pricing Project, you have put $64 million in, that is for environmental review and design that we would continue to work through uh, with the region. And then construction would be funded through toll revenue from the project once we'd received all the necessary approvals and completed the design and environmental review. On toll systems implementation, this is currently fully funded uh, through the commission's work. Uh, so this would complete the work on the back office and roadside systems that are needed to collect the tolls beginning in 2026. What you can see is that that is a grand total of $1,087 million. That would leave us with remaining funding of about $15 million compared to the, the funds we uh, believe we have reasonably available to us. Uh, that's pretty tight. It puts us at some level of risk that if either costs grow or revenues come in under what we expect, uh, that we could be back coming to the OTC asking you for either additional funding uh, or re to reduce the scope on one or more of these projects. Uh, and it may be difficult to reduce scope at that point, uh, depending on how far into the projects we are. So that is the, the short-term finance plan. I will pause there before turning toward the long-term and see if there are any questions. So there's any questions from any of the commissioners? Commissioner Smith. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, it's a lot of information <laughs> and I um, appreciate uh, all the work that you put put into putting this together and um, just to 
to respond to some of the comments we had. Um, we've only seen this information recently too. So it is um, a result of the legislature uh, directing us to pause tolling and the governor's request for a funding plan. So it's a, sh a short amount of time to do a, a whole lot of work. Um, and it is concerning that every time we delay anything, it costs more. And in this case, it, it appears that, um, you know, due to inflation, costs are rising, it's going to be more expensive to deliver these projects because of the delay. Um, so in estimating going forward, can you speak to what level of inflation you're, you have built into these numbers uh, so that we understand kind of the risk associated with that? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Smith, absolutely, uh, and Chair Brown, uh, the inflationary expectation that is laid out uh, to get us to the numbers uh, that we present here, and also to get us to the numbers that are included in the, the future finance strategy uh, is 3.5% per year. Now that is lower than what we have currently been experiencing over the last couple of years. Uh, and yet that is a consensus estimate uh, of our independent cost estimators that the Urban Mobility Office has engaged, as well as ODOT's economists. In fact, the ODOT economists tell me they're predicting about 3.2% per year, uh, so that this is built in a little bit of a margin of safety uh, to be a little bit more conservative. Now, that may seem strange given the historically high levels of inflation we've had, uh, but last week I went back and did some analysis of the Federal Highway Administration National Highway Construction Cost Index that Mr. Finn showed you earlier. While we've had a very high run-up in inflation over the last two years, the actual uh, average 10-year increase is uh, more in the 3% range. And that's because highway construction costs are highly attuned to the business cycle, so that at the peak of the business cycle, as we're at today with very low unemployment, strong economic growth, you have very rapid run-up in construction costs, uh, largely due to, to material cost issues. Uh, same that thing happened to us in 2005 through 2008, where we had historically high run-up in costs. Uh, and then in the uh, trough of the business cycle, uh, you typically have much slower construction cost growth. In fact, we actually had negative uh, construction cost growth for several years. That was during the Great Recession, so probably not something I would ever hold up as a, an expectation we would look for. But we do believe that a 3.5% uh, inflationary uh, adjustment uh, in this plan is reasonable, and yet it is one of the things that uh, in the risk slide I will show you in a little while, uh, we lay out that if you were to have something closer to say 5% inflation, there would be an impact for each project, uh, particularly if they were delayed into the future. Thank you. A uh, follow up. Um, in terms of uh, the numbers, which ones do you think are the higher risk? It seems to me the soil stabilization number uh, could could vary depending upon what we find as we go forward. What I'm concerned about is we have $15 million cushion, and I think we've got some uncertainties, inflation being one and the, the projected costs being another. And where I'm headed with this is, I think we're gonna need to develop a backup plan. Um, where do we get the money if we run out of the $15 million? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Smith, uh, Chair Brown, I'll take a, a brief stab at that and then also uh, turn to Mr. Finn to see if he has any thoughts. Uh, on I-205 Abernathy, there's clearly some risk because anytime you open up an, an older bridge, there's a chance that you find something uh, that you weren't expecting. But we have built in uh, some contingency in that estimate because we did not want to come to you with a number uh, that was going to be one that we would quickly exceed. Uh, so there is certainly some risk there. Uh, I think on the rose quarter, there is perhaps less risk because we simply, you know, the, the number that you give us can can become the number that we have to manage to, uh, and we will complete the work that is available under that amount. Uh, the regional mobility pricing project is certainly one. Uh, we've given the level of conversation in the region. It's clear we need to work very closely with our partners in the region to move that forward, and that will involve doing a lot of work 
uh, looking at different scenarios and options and uh, doing the public engagement. So certainly that is a, a, an effort of environmental review and design that could become more expensive than the, the number shown there. Uh, so, th so those would be a couple of the areas that I would look at. Thank you. I don't have anything else at this point. I should actually also note toll systems implementation is one. We are putting out an RFP within the next month for to request a uh, private sector vendor. Once we have the pricing from the, the vendor, we will have a better sense of what that implementation cost is, but we, we believe that this is a, a fairly reasonable estimate, uh, but there is some risk there as well. Okay. Is there any other commissioners like to ask a question? I think Commissioner Baker, I believe I, you unmuted. Can you okay. hear me okay? Yes. Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, We've got uh, some uh, assumptions on uh, uh, the toll revenues, which means that you've got some assumption on toll rates mm -hmm. that the commissioners are uh, going to eventually have to approve. It might be helpful to have some interim feedback from us on the algorithm uh, as to uh, what those rates would be, just a thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you comment on the, on the uh, share of the, uh, toll revenue that you anticipate that would be assisting uh, for the mitigation for the uh, for the cities and, and counties. Also, I'm uh, on on their roads. I'm I'm also uh, wondering what uh, the assumption was for the cost of capital for the debt service. Thank you. Uh, Chair Brown, Commissioner Baker. So I think there was about three questions there, and I'll try to remember all of those. So uh, first off, uh, the the question about the cost of capital. For I-205, we have assumed a TIFIA loan from the federal government uh, to maximize our uh, funding streams. TIFIA loans are usually very close to the federal government's uh, borrowing rate. Uh, those float over time, but they are uh, relatively low. So I think we're we're looking at uh, potentially, you know, somewhere around four uh, percent, with also very favorable financing terms, low coverage rates. Typically, toll bonds uh, require a coverage rate of say, you know, one point seven five uh, times uh, your your uh, amount that's bonded, meaning you need seventy five percent more money in reserve than you can actually bond against. TIFI is much lower, you know, 1.5 or below, and also can be repaid over a course of about 35 years. Uh, so that is a, a very favorable cost of capital and financing terms that are assumed for that. The good thing is the TIFIA program has a very robust funding uh, and is has been, in fact, most years does not uh, use up all of the credit subsidy that has been allocated to it by Congress. So we have, uh, it's not highly competitive in the same way some of those other funding streams are. Uh, your question about the toll rate schedule, that is one that we shared with the commission back in the spring, I believe it was in March, and had a conversation with the level two traffic and revenue analysis. Uh, we, in that process, modeled one set of toll rates uh, that ranged from 55 cents uh, overnight uh, to about $2.20 at peak hour for each of the two bridges, Abernathy and the Tualatin River Bridge, with interim rates below that as well. Uh, as we go forward, uh, Commissioner, uh, you raise a really good point that we should have those conversations with the commission. We're going to be looking at uh, approximately four different toll revenue scenarios uh, that will have perhaps a smaller, uh, a lower peak and a higher off-peak rate to model what happens to congestion. And, and if you are to uh, reduce the burden on those who have to travel at peak hour, we'll be looking at other options as well. And so we can have a conversation with the commission about what exactly those look like uh, and make sure that we're structuring that in a way that, that meets your uh, needs and desires. As for the money that was set aside for uh, mitigation projects, I believe of that $84 million, we had set aside originally about $30 million that could be used for mitigation and, and mitigation that is, uh, in this case, directly tied to the specific impacts of the toll project. Now that number will need to be adjusted uh, as we look at the specific impacts that we see uh, in our traffic and revenue analysis over the next six months to a year, as we look at uh, what the impact would be of actually towing only the Abernathy Bridge. Uh, for obvious reasons, we believe that the, the rerouting impacts onto local roads will be less with one toll versus two tolls initially. Uh, and so that there, there may be less 
uh, impact on those local roads. Brendan, anything to add? Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Baker, uh, just, yeah, the, the mitigation effort isn't one that's based on a percentage. Uh, it is based on a, a regional model that uh, that uh, all municipalities in the Portland metropolitan region that's run by a regional government uh, have agreed to. Um, and th that identifies uh, through the science of that process, what impacts are going to be having. And for the I-205 environmental assessment, um, you can see exactly where those impacts are going to be, what investments uh, that were going to be made to make sure that the impacts of the tolling system uh, on the I-205 were uh, will be mitigated. We're, we are required to do that uh, through um, the National Environmental Policy Act, and that needs to be signed off on uh, by our federal partners at the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, so those mitigation efforts um, are, are in the existing environmental assessments as it, as it relates to I-205. We have not costed out uh, the entirety of those, but they we feel they uh, they fall well within the range uh, that Mr. Brower has provided for us. Uh, and that's based on the feedback you've received from the cities and the counties, or is that uh, an independent assessment of that? No, yeah, they are a part of our technical mitigation team, so they have reviewed that analysis. Um, I, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Baker, uh, I will say, uh, you know, after lo lots of conversations with the local mayors there, uh, they don't feel that that's, that's enough um, from what they saw there based on, on that modeling. Director Strickler and I are heading up a conversation with uh, all regional leaders around, uh, around the I-205 project and the Regional Mobility Pricing Project uh, to really engage them about their communities and what their needs are. Behind, uh, beyond the modeling and scientific process that goes beyond uh, goes into the uh, National Environmental Policy Act and the approvals we need from the federal government. Yeah, it it, uh, it becomes really important here because I think uh, 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 ODOT historically has uh, been uh, been quite good with regard to parity uh, with uh, uh, users and uh, of our. Uh, of our roads and and the costs that uh, that each of us as individuals pay, as well as you know those issues in and around the, uh, the projects that we're working on, and this is a big test for us because uh, we're going to be asking uh, uh, people in and along that uh, 205 corridor uh, to pay more, uh, as Mr. McCabe uh, pointed out, uh, and in, in in this case it's. Um, a project in terms of uh, seismic uh, retrofitting of, of the Abernathy Bridge, which is in the best interest of uh, uh, a wide, wide range of Oregonians in addition to just those that are living on either, either side of the bridge. So I, I would really emphasize uh, communication and uh, as much uh, help as we can give uh, the citizens of Oregon living around it and, and the Communities are going to have to react to the mitigation uh, because it it uh, will say a lot in terms of our ability to uh, uh, put tolling in other places if we, if we really believe that it's going to be a significant piece of our funding algorithm going forward. So thank you. Just a comment. Thank you for your comments. Is there any other comments or questions from the commissioners? Yeah, I don't see any. So Travis, we'll move on. Thank you. Uh, let's go on to the next slide then and shift into looking at the long term. So based on the project cost that we've showed you uh, to date of the, the total project cost that we've estimated based on those construction start dates, after you spend about $1.1 billion in the, the money that we have uh, available today, we have a program that costs about $2.6 billion to $3.3 billion that, that remains to be funded. Uh, you can see all the cost estimates there for the remaining work mm -hmm. that would need to be done. I won't work, walk you through all of those, uh, but suffice to say that there's significant construction costs remaining on the Rose Quarter, uh, as well as on I-205 Phase 2, Boone Bridge, and the, the toll program as well. So next slide, please. There are a number of potential funding sources for the uh, second phase of this program. Uh, I noted earlier that we have the expectation of regional mobility pricing project toll revenue, but that we have not yet uh, 
estimated how much that would yield in terms of annual total revenue, much less the total financial capacity, because we are still early in the process of working with the region to develop that toll rate framework. We also, as I noted, have federal competitive grants, particularly the infra program and reconnecting communities, uh, where we think we could secure a not insignificant amount of federal dollars. I will note, though, that general the generally the federal government likes to be the last dollar in. So it is uh, important for us to get the rest of the funding laid out for these projects, uh, just as we are doing right now for the interstate bridge with the action in the legislature to provide a commitment of a billion dollars. Uh, that we believe will be sufficient to be able to go to the federal government and leverage additional federal resources. Given the size and scope and length of this program, we also believe there could be opportunities for uh, funding from a future state transportation funding package. Uh, and of course, there's always the option for the commission to put additional funding in from the statewide transportation improvement program. To date, the commission has elected and, and generally directed ODOT uh, to keep the urban mobility strategy as essentially a separate bucket using its own funding sources. So there's been relatively limited funding from the commission that has been gone that has gone into the program, largely funding uh, that was designed to kickstart tolling uh, about two and a half years ago when we needed some additional resources there. So those are the potential funding sources that we have available uh, to us. Next slide, please. We need to do some additional work though to help us further develop the long-term finance plan and firm up the actual amounts that we expect we can get. So over the next couple of years, we have uh, four primary steps. So first, uh, on I-205 toll revenues, we need to work with the region, uh, with the commission, with the, the legislature uh, on additional work here, uh, including the additional analysis of toll scenarios and associated uh, revenues, uh, environmental review that's required under NEPA, uh, doing the level two traffic and revenue analysis in the next year, and then finally do that investment grade or level three traffic and revenue analysis that will allow you to actually set the tolls. Uh, that would come about probably about six months before tolling goes into effect that we would finalize that. On the RMPP, we need to develop those options, uh, have the conversation with the, the region on what the total rate framework looks like in the environmental review process. And then based on that preferred option or multiple options even, we can analyze uh, RMPP revenues in a level two traffic and revenue analysis and then determine the total financial resources uh, that would be available. So it's a th really a three-step process on RMPP. And we are just uh, in that first step. And then obviously uh, on an ongoing basis, we'll be refining project costs through the design process. And we'll learn more about that uh, as that work goes forward, as we see uh, what construction costs do in the not too distant future. All right, next slide, please. So this is the last slide I will bring to you, which basically tries to amalgamate all the, the major financial risks that we have identified in the plan. So there are a couple of fairly low level risks uh, around cash flow and HB 2017 funding that have relatively limited impact, you know, ten, tens of millions of dollars, uh, as significant as that can be in the scope of a multi-billion dollar program. We're talking relatively limited risk and uh, likely can be, be mitigated. Uh, on the other side, there are risks around inflation and project delays that will, could raise the, the price of these projects in uh, even further. As noted earlier, we've got about a 3.5% inflation adjustment uh, assumed, but if inflation was higher, certainly that would have an impact and delays in projects for any region would also, a reason would also increase costs. So these could range, uh, you know, to, to well over hundred million dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in the scope of the finance plan. And then the, the largest risk that we've already discussed is what if tolling doesn't happen or uh, if tolling is limited in such a way that it, it significantly reduces the resources. Uh, that would, that's the highest risk that we see here uh, in terms of the overall financial impact as that could be hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, you know, we've already built in $385 million uh, on I-205 for funding there. So I will pause there before turning it over to Brendan, who will take you back and have a conversation about the short-term finance plan and some of the modifications we've proposed. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Does anybody have any questions at this point? I'm going to keep moving forward then. So Brendan, the okay, floor is yours. Madam Chair, uh, thank you. Just a couple more slides here um, uh, for your consideration before we get to uh, the discussion. Uh, on moving this forward. We'll go to the next slide, please. 
Um, I'm going to offer up a couple modifications um, uh, that are, uh, you'll see are again, slight to what Mr. Brower uh, presented. Um, before I do on, on Rose Quarter, I, uh, again, be a little bit remiss if I didn't uh, reflect back again on, on the meeting that I had last night with the historic Elbine Advisory Board. And again, I don't want to speak for those individuals and those voices because the entire intent of setting up that board was to elevate the voices of that community. Uh, but I think they would be okay uh, for me to convey uh, where their disappointment resided uh, last night was um, the work that they've put in uh, as far as it relates to our equity workforce plan and the jobs and what former uh, Vice Chair Simpson used to refer to as economic justice uh, portion of this was going to be put off into the future. Um, I think that's where, where that, is, that, that is stemming from. I think they'd um, be okay with me uh, conveying that to you. Uh, you'll hear more of that. But as we requested them to continue with us on this journey, uh, with the Rose Quarter project. Uh, we have a uh, couple options here on, on how we move forward uh, in modifications. Obviously getting this project to a point where it's shovel ready will put us in a, in a more competitive position, uh, obviously as it relates to federal opportunities. Uh, we didn't talk about it here, but uh, our delegation weighed in um, early on in the hybrid three process in fact, the entire uh, federal delegation about how we had to uh, build something to inspire. Um, we think we have, and we've done it with par in partnership with the community and the region. Uh, so we want to continue that work forward. And as you'll see, uh, of the three options, the one in the middle is that you is the one we saw in Mr. Brower's presentation uh, that asks us to get to a 100% design for, uh, for all of the early work packages and get us to a 30% design of the, of the main construction package that is requesting an additional $44 million of investment um, that will be uh, continue this work and get us through the federal approval process and uh, the final touches on those portions of design. Two other options that we wanted to present uh, to the commission was uh, scaling that back a little bit, uh, which would save us uh, $15 million and get us to those lower levels of design, 90% on work packages A and B, 30% for C, and 30% for the main work package. And then also the option uh, to, uh, to go a little further, uh, to get to 100% design of all of those packages, um, that would be uh, an additional 84 uh, to $104 million. Uh, before we ask for your deliberation on that, we'll go uh, to the next slide because I want to provide one other modification before I turn it back to you, uh, Madam Chair, for discussion and questions. And that's a modification option on uh, the I-205 improvements project. Uh, keeping um, Oregonian safe is key to everything we do. Creating a resilient system as it relates to being earthquake ready is uh, obviously um, something that's important to this commission um, and to the agency. So we did put a, uh, an option in there as far as making the Tualatin River Bridge, uh, which is a, um, the other main waterway that, uh, over that corridor to make that uh, earthquake ready. Uh, the cost for that is between 125 and 175 million. Um, this unfortunately could be funded through cutting other projects across the state through the STIP bridge and seismic programs. Um, and as Mr. Brower mentioned, uh, you can see the total that's there statewide uh, in the 24-27 STIP. Um, and this alternative option uh, would be would leave this to the 205 uh, phase two. So um, difficult decisions uh, we know we, we bring forward uh, for you to you for your consideration. Uh, I'll stop there, Madam Chair, so we can answer any questions and let the commission deliberate. So are there any questions from any of the commis commissioners? I, I guess, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, if there's anything else that uh, Mr. Brower, Director Strickler wanted to add, I guess I would stop this one. So I don't see any hands raised. So we'll move on. I, I would, um, before us is really, really hard decisions. And um, I think that one of the things that keeps crossing my mind is we have been given a very short period of time to produce this plan to the governor's office. And it is a living document and can be changed at any given time. So I don't think that whatever is being proposed by us is 
on solid ground to the point where it couldn't be changed. Um, we do have to make these decisions. And I think when, as we open up um, and everyone's able to give their opinion on this, um, I just want to say to not only the staff, I know this has been a tremendous amount of hard work. You've had to produce something in a very short period of time. We've been pretty critical along with the public. Um, everyone is frustrated and there are going to be people who are, are continually frustrated as we leave this meeting um, because they don't like the decision that was made by the commission. But we're doing the best that we can. It's a very difficult position. And so at this point, I just like to open this up for discussion. Um, so I see that Commissioner Beyer has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, let me thank the staff. I think they've done a really good job in putting the proposal together, and I would emphasize it's a strategy. It's not necessarily how we finally end up on this, but it is a strategy. Uh, frankly, I think it's a high-risk strategy. I think there's a, uh, I, I would say, a higher potential for problems than I think the staff is a little uh, more optimistic about some of the funding pieces than I am, you know, particularly even on the federal side, since we've got two major projects in competition for, quote, Oregon's share of that money. We've got the interstate bridge, and then we have this. So I, I, I think that's that'll be interesting to see how that goes. I want to go back and just because we have a couple of new commissioners and welcome both of you for joining us. Um, you know, I go back to 2017 and chaired the committee that put these projects together. A lot of discussion. The three projects that we're talking about up there, there's a lot of discussion on that, but it was, if you will, in the legislature to broker broker deal that there would be state financing, and there is uh, from general transportation revenue, but it was viewed particularly by the rural legislators who approved this project that because so much of it is impacting on people who just live in the metro area, that polling made sense. Uh, that's where that came from. The other thing I will say, the Rose Quarter project, which I think is a great project, uh, a lot of criticism about the increasing cost in that. From my perspective, the project that was approved in 2017 is vastly different than the project that's proposed today. And so it's reasonable that costs will have gone up. Uh, and I think it's a good project. And I, I wanna be really clear that I am supportive of moving forward if we can find the money to do it. I'm committed to that. And I believe the commission probably is as a whole as well. And I know the director is uh, very committed to that. So uh, th those are some overall concerns that I have with, with the project. Moving forward, I suspect that we're going to see some delays and we will likely see some cost creep on these, but they're important projects uh, just the same. Uh, my other comment is we got to keep in mind that we're responsible for statewide transportation. And in order to keep political balance, we have to make sure that we don't neglect the other 90% of the state as we move forward on this. We have a lot of projects that are in the step that are important. Uh, they're just as important to those communities as these projects are important to the metro area. And I wouldn't want to see us rob those. Uh, one of the fiscal realities is we have to move forward on Abernathy because we're in the midst of construction. We really don't have an alternative there and there aren't very many value uh, adjustments that you can get out of the project. I don't think, you know, maybe the engineers can find something, but if the bond, if the, if the polling doesn't go forward, we just need to be aware that that's going to require taking some money out of the step out of existing approved projects. I think that's just a reality that we're looking at. Uh, and uh, the other piece, I, I know we heard a lot of people this morning commenting on finding other revenue sources. If not for the tolling, then that decision, that funding source 
has to come from the legislature. They would be the one that would have to either increase transportation taxes or general fund. They could do that, but that's not a decision that we can make. They have to figure that one out. And as you, if you followed the legislature this year, there's a lot of discussion about uh, hauling and, and replacing it with something else. Uh, it's a limited thing to do that. And so that, Madam Chair, that's, that's kind of my sense on it. I personally, uh, would move forward in supporting uh, the staff proposal here. I would not add or touch any of the options. Uh, I'm not really willing to get into higher risk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Byer. Commissioner Smith. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah. Congratulations, by the way, Madam Chair, on your um, appointment as chair. We didn't get to that. Um, I, I generally agree with uh, what Commissioner Byer said. Uh, I think there's risk here and um, uh, it makes me uncomfortable. On the other hand, I think there's also risk if we just pull the plug. As we know, stopping everything now will just mean it'll cost more later. And as we've discovered, as Every time these projects get delayed, they cost more to build. So I'm generally supportive of, of we've got to finish the bridge work. We've got to do the soil stabilization. I think it makes sense to go forward um, with uh, the Rose Quarter as proposed, uh, understanding that, um, you know, the best would be that we could proceed with construction. So we would have those jobs for economic justice, but we frankly don't have the money. So I'd like to get the design work to the point where as we try and get the money, uh, we're ready to go. So I, I'm comfortable with that. I think we're going to end up eating through that $15 million quote contingency or, or extra funds pretty quick. And I think we need to, as we go forward, have um, a plan, where are we going to get those funds if we need them? And because this is a very um, Portland-centric project, I mean, it does impact the rest of the state too, but I think we need to be looking at where reasonable, if we have to go into the STIP, that should come from Region 1. But again, that's we've got more work to do as we go forward. We need to represent the entire state. I think having the seismically ready bridge does help the entire state for when we have an earthquake, we are going to need to be able to move people um, to safety. And so I'm comfortable with the recommendation, having noted that there's a lot of uncertainty and risk there. And I think we just need to keep moving forward as best we can. Thank you, Commissioner Smith, for your remarks. And thank you for acknowledging that I've taken on the position of chair. I'm so thrilled at this point <laughs> in my life to uh, take that position. And also I want, we've neglected to announce that um, Commissioner Byer is now vice chair. So thank you. Um, and thank you for your comments. Would either of the other two commissioners like to comment? Uh, sure. Uh, Go ahead, Commissioner Baker. Uh, uh, a, a couple of thoughts. Uh, the uh, uh, we need to understand too when we're looking at these risks uh, what our what our cost of funding uh, risks are, and it, it would be good to know what happens for every you know ten basis points of uh, increased cost of funding, and and what that will do uh, in our risks. I I think. Uh, Commissioner uh, Byer, I uh, really uh, appreciate uh, your comments there and, and some history. And I apologize for being the new guy, uh, you know, ask, asking some uh, um, uh, some naive questions here. But so bear with me. But as it relates to uh, the Rose Quarter, and again, I, I think we're all feeling like uh, this is a this is an important project on a whole lot of levels. The uh, uh, 
the the costs from the time that uh, the commission last uh, looked at this in 21 uh, versus the uh, the costs that we're looking at today have increased by 30 percent and uh, and I'm just curious about uh, governance and what happens when we get uh, uh, scope creep when we get inflation uh, that reaches a certain magnitude at what at what point uh, do we have uh, an obligation to go back and and uh, relook at uh, decisions that we've made uh, in the past, whether it be uh, 205 or, or or whether it be a Rose Quarter or anything else that that uh, that we've got coming along? Because obviously this is a, it's an important, but it's becoming uh, increasingly expensive, and it appears that we're not done uh, yet in terms of defining what the overall uh, scope of the project is. So. Uh, do we do we have a responsibility at this point? Uh, is there governance around uh, retaking a look at this, or um, uh, you know, uh, uh, other entities that have a stake in it? The governor's office, the commission, or the uh, uh, legis uh, the legislature. Start, Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Baker. I, I guess I'd say first on the the scope creep topic. Um, obviously, a lot of these changes um, came, came forward through uh, various discussions, various tables. Uh, this is the design uh, that we are taking through the environmental process. Uh, this is the design that we are seeking federal approval on. Um, I think we've uh, come to a pens down moment. Um, and we feel that our partners uh, and the community uh, feel that way too. So this, this is what we're carrying forward. Um, through uh, obviously the iterations that we've had, the conversations with the commission uh, and others. So I, I guess I want to get out in front of that, Commissioner. Um, uh, this is this is the time where we're putting the pens down and we're taking this this design forward. Okay. So as as I understand that the design is uh, is frozen at this point. It's pens down. Uh, no more changes. Well, I, I, I will say that we are going through an environmental process right now. Um, yeah. We are working with our federal partners. Uh, I, so I don't want to get out in front of, of that, um, uh, Commissioner. We, we do need to uh, still look at some of the efforts uh, that we're going to need to put in uh, to get that approval. Uh, they have not signaled that yet. So I guess um, I want to I want to I want to caveat that. But th this is this is the uh, this is the design that we've been that we're putting forward. Okay, you know, I, I think it's important, you know, when we look at any project, there's constraints. And as we're wrestling with them today, we've got financial constraints, we've got time constraints, we've got other constraints that, that go into it. So, uh, you know, we, we, need, we need to manage them and not, not let them get away from us because uh, ultimately uh, time uh, kills projects and costs kill projects. So we have to be really diligent, especially when there's something as important as this one. Uh, to really be on top of our game and uh, and be sure that we uh, we manage it uh, in such a way that it can reach a, a, a really great conclusion. So uh, the the other uh, the other thought I had here uh, is in and around the uh, the STIP and the use of STIP uh, funds, and I'm concerned about it. I I think you know fortunately I, I had a. Uh, Wonderful process of uh, onboarding uh, by uh, Director Strickler and his, and his his team, and and one of the things I came away concerned about was uh, the uh, the funds that are available in and around uh, operating and maintaining our uh, existing system, and you know we've not only got uh, seismic uh, issues that uh, we're concerned about and thinking about you know, what happens with Cascadia, but we do have the real issues right now that are with us right now, this very moment, uh, as it relates to climate change and the effect that it has on our ability to uh, keep our transportation system up and running, whether it be uh, the fires that we experienced two years ago, uh, whether it be uh, the lack of predictability relative to rain, as we saw on Highway 20 and getting uh, 20 feet of uh, mud across the highway uh, that we needed to remove. And uh, so it, it's a, you know, that by itself is a big issue. And the second one I would say is that, you know, our, uh, our rate of uh, uh, fatalities uh, 
is uh, above uh, a level that we certainly would like it to be, and it's growing. So issues in and around safety and getting our, uh, uh, our pedestrians, our uh, cyclists, our uh, uh, users of uh, automobiles and trucks uh, safely from point A to point B is a big deal. And uh, I would be really concerned about directing uh, uh, a disproportionate amount of our STIP to uh, seismic readiness at this moment that we might choose to uh, put that off to some degree and, and until we make sure that these real issues that are in front of us today with regard to uh, safety and uh, climate change uh, that, that we're giving uh, ODOT the capability and the operations and maintenance group and you know all the districts around the state to be able to deal with this. So uh, my two bits on that subject, I, 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 I would not like to see us uh, move step uh, uh, into seismic at this moment. Thank you for your comments. Commissioner Chapman, would you like to comment? Uh oh. We can't hear you. I, I believe you're on mute. Well, no, she's off mute, but it's still not working. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, while you're trying to figure out your technology and see if you can um, fix that, I'll go ahead and comment. And um, it was really interesting. Last night I had a conversation with, with someone that works for ODOT. And, you know, I, I made the analogy, the emperor has no clothes on. And they didn't have any clue what I was referring to. So it kind of showed what generation I'm from. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is we're out of money. And we have been for a period of time. I think that Mr. Courtright um, pointed that out in his comments early on. We have been tracking this. The commission has been tracking it. Believe me, I think I have um, spent a lot of evenings along with the director trying to figure out what we can do. And I don't, I want to make sure that nobody was offended by my remarks that we're going to call upon you. It wasn't meant to say that you haven't been involved and the people that have been trying to move these projects haven't been involved. Everyone has. Um, the outcry from the public has been great. Um, you know, everyone has different opinions. With that, somehow we have to balance this. And the bottom line is now, no pun intended, the rubbers met, met, hit the road and we are at a point where we have to make a hard decision. Um, I think that my opinion on it is moving forward with the plan that we have, although I would like to see some of the modifications. I can't do it at this point because I don't feel as though we should be taking from the stip. Um, I don't believe that we should be compromising other things. And I think the one thing that I'm going to encourage the staff is we need to nail down the tolling. I think that when we answer that question and, or, and we can move forward with an idea of what, what dollars we really do have available, because this is really just speculation on our part um, of the funding that we're going to have available. And we also need to start prioritizing. But we did make a commitment to the Rose Quarter, and I'm not willing to back off of that. Um, and unfortunately, we do have a different plan than when we first started into it, and the cost is astronomical. Um, we need to figure a way of doing it. And it may be compromise on both sides. It may that be a community compromise. It may be you know, our compromise, but we need to figure this out and move forward to, with it. So my feeling on it is I support the plan that the staff is going to move forward. I think it's a starting conversation with the governor's office 
And I think that at some point we need to get not only our legislators, but our governor involved in having a conversation about where we're going to go for funding. That means a transportation funding package. And one of the things that I have committed to the director, to the rest of the commission and to the governor's office is I'm all in. We're gonna make this happen. We're gonna figure this out. It's not going to be easy, but we have to do it. So at this point, I think we need to lay it out on the table that this is where we're at and this is how we're gonna move forward at for the time being until we're given a different direction. If the direction is we're not gonna toll at all, then we're gonna to have to pivot hard and make really difficult decisions. So those are the end of my comments and we'll try and see if Commissioner Chapman's able to speak to us yet. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I totally agree. We've got some difficult uh, trade-offs that we need to evaluate and it's it's very, challenging to do that without reliable projections on the tolling revenue and the timeline to have those funds available. Uh, I'm, I'm not comfortable speculating without that data or those estimates, um, but I do think that there is going to have to be an additional ask to our legislature to cover the gaps to meet some of these ambitious project goals. And I really want to reiterate that the commitment that we've made on the Rose Quarter, both to alleviate the, the, the congestion issue and the um, economic implications of not doing so, but also the need to reestablish trust with a community that has really um, been marginalized by the decisions that have been made in the past without their input. Uh, I, I don't think it's politically tenable for us to consider scrapping that project. And I, I do think that there are gonna have to be some compromises and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the outcome of the environmental um, studies that are ongoing before we finalize the design, but that is not something that I think is um, on the table, scrapping that project altogether. Need to get a stronger thumb, I think, to push this button. Thank you for your comments. And I'm just gonna turn also to the director and see if, oh, is some, oh, lead, Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call you. Sorry, Vice Chair Byer. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to reemphasize, I think we're all saying the same thing. Um, Rose Quarter is an important project. And it, it is a significantly different project than what was originally presented in 2017. Uh, but I think we need to realize, and, and I'm reacting a little bit to Commissioner Baker's comments, I think ODOT responded, well, that's a community redevelopment reconnect project that addresses past sins, if you will. And I think that's important to do that, but it's not a typical transportation project. The transportation project was, was really driven mostly by Oregon's Trucking Association, which needed to get that congestion point relieved. And, and that piece of its not that great. I mean, putting the lids over on that is a is a an important and needed uh, social investment, and uh, I think we need to find a way to do that. And to uh, Commissioner Chapman's comments, it strikes me that it is reasonable to ask the legislature to again address that. Although I will tell you, it was not an easy discussion in 2017. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Director? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the commission, uh, first let me also offer my congratulations to uh, the chair uh, and our new members. Uh, it's great to have everybody together, even on a difficult topic, but quite frankly, your dedication to the conversation really shows the leadership in the room, and so I appreciate that. Uh, I also wanna say, uh, while this presentation and really the ask before us uh, to present something on the July 1st timeframe is really focused on finance. It's focused on uh, the dollars and cents associated with decisions, um, and that's decisions in the past as well as decisions evolving into the future. Uh, there are those other elements, and so I appreciate the Commission's recognition of the other elements of risk that really are less quantifiable, or at least quantifiable as it relates to dollar signs. Um, I want to recognize that uh, we have made commitments, and I'll, I'll say 
uh, Mr. Finn has done a fantastic job, I think, of describing uh, that we can't speak for every community. Uh, but what we can do is we can be a better representative for those communities that either aren't present in the room today uh, or haven't historically been present as decisions have been made. And while we won't get everything right 100% of the time, uh, we have a job, I think, uh, and an obligation, and I will tell you I have a personal bias, uh, to represent those voices that, frankly, have historically not been part of the decision making. Uh, and I think that's inherent in the discussion that I'm hearing here. Uh, Commissioner Baker, you referenced what I thought was a great question around governance. And I think uh, our statements and our, our conversation around governance has evolved, uh, not just as ODOT, uh, but as the transportation sector. Um, we have always been, and you probably heard me say this too many times, but we've always been uh, in the transportation sector, uh, an industry focused on the things that we can produce. And I think we're in an evolution uh, in the right direction to be focused on the people that we serve and the things come second. Uh, and those things then have to satisfy those needs, but it also means that we have to have others helping us to design the outcomes uh, that we're looking for. And so sometimes that does mean uh, increasing scope. Um, and it's, uh, I know that's probably um, a little bit of bias as I describe it this way, but I'd say in, in the case of Rose Quarter, for example, uh, I would say probably less of scope creep and more of getting the scope right um, because we didn't have it right to begin with. We had a transportation project that ignored some of the other injustices that we had employed. Uh, and so that's why I appreciate that question because I think it brings into question uh, how those decisions are made, how they've been made in the past, how you revisit them. Uh, and I think to that point, we revisited how decisions were made in the past, spe specifically for Rose Quarter. Uh, and have come up with a better outcome. The better outcome costs a lot more money, and we're now in this position that we have to talk about how to fund it. Uh, I can personally attest to, though, um, we've got a community that um, has historically heard, uh, not you, not now, uh, and it's too expensive. And I think we're trying to create a conversation that says uh, we're all in this together, and sometimes these things are expensive, especially getting to the right thing. Um, so with that, uh, probably more than you were asking for, Madam Chair, but uh, I do appreciate uh, the Commission's engagement and involvement uh, and bringing to the table the other risks associated with how we serve Oregonians, um, in addition to the financial risk that you have in front of you, uh, and the difficulty in the decision is not lost on me. Thank you, Director. So at this point, we're at the I'm I'm looking for a motion to uh, move forward and submit our report to the governor. Oh, yes, Vice Chair Byer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move that the commission adopt the staff's recommended urban mobility strategic or strategy finance plan and submit it to the governor as the commission's recommendation. Okay. And do we have a second? Second. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Smith. Discussion? Don't, I think we've discussed it quite a bit. <laughs> and just for process, I want to, um, in case you're just tuning in, Commissioner um, Baker is not going to vote because he isn't fully um, seated on the commission yet. So we will do, I guess we won't do a roll call, but all those in favor of um, submitting this report, say aye. 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 All right, you have your motion. And before we leave this meeting, and staff, thank you again for your hard work on this. I wanted to, um, earlier we tried to kind of pivot and, and um, introduce our new commissioners. So if there is, now that you've completed your first meeting, and it, it's been relatively not that difficult. I think some of the other commissioners that have come on board have had hours of testimony um, at their first meeting, but um, I don't know if you would like to say anything. So we'll start with Commissioner Chapman. Sorry, I'm putting you right on the spot there. Thanks very much, Chair. Yeah, Alicia Chapman, I'm the owner and uh, CEO of Lamet Technical Fabricators. We are a heavy fabrication shop based in Portland. Uh, we do a lot of projects related to some of ODOT's priorities. So uh, I'm very actively involved in the construction and um, infrastructure community uh, and some community trade associations. Um, 
very focused on how we're going to meet the demand for skilled labor and the workforce to bring some of these projects to fruition. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be able to work with you all and address some of these really um, complex challenges ahead of us. Thank you. And Commissioner Baker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can't tell you how happy I am to be here. Uh, and uh, I had uh, sent word uh, to the governor uh, that uh, I was available to help as uh, as, as she needed, and, and I was approached to be a, com a commissioner on, on the OTC. I don't have a great deal of experience in transportation other than uh, for the last 15 years being in the wholesale distribution business and moving a lot of construction material in and around uh, the state and having uh, a, a lot of employees. So I worry <clears throat> about uh, how to get the right material to the right place at the right time for for many, many years. So uh, I've been uh, uh, here in Oregon for over 65 years. After I'd been here 30 years, somebody told me I could consider myself a local and not a native. Uh, but uh, 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 Oregon is uh, is home for me, and uh, I'm I'm really committed to uh, helping us make a difference, and uh, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. So uh, difficult uh, problems uh, are something that I've uh, I've sunk my teeth into for many years. I've been really fortunate to have been a leader of companies for better than four decades. Uh, so. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm I'm really really pleased uh, to be here and hope I can make a difference for Oregonians. Well, thank you both for your comments. I know on behalf of the director's office, the staff, and the rest of the commissioners, and they can actually speak up if they want. But um, we are thrilled to have you join us. Um, I think that you kind of heard the marching orders where I talked about we will make this happen. We have to. Um, you have some brilliant minds sitting around. This commission at this point, well, maybe four out of five, but uh, <laughs> honestly, you know, this is, I, I look forward to working with each one of you. And I think that we will make a difference. It's, it's going to be a, a long, hard um, next couple of years, but I think that we can get this taken care of and, and serve the Oregonian, you know, across the state, not just in the, in the metro area. So thank you for joining us. Um, we'll try not to uh, task you with too many things right out the gate, but um, I think that all of us can attest that we are all volunteers, um, but we have our hands full. We're all trying to make this happen in many things. And although these projects are important, there's many more things happening across the state that we're responsible for, and we're trying to really juggle everything. So Thank you again for joining us. And um, you probably should have looked into it a little bit more before you volunteered. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. So thank you. With that said, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. We're right on time. So thank you to everyone for keeping us on our task. We're adjourned. See you in Pendleton.